Section 6.5, Quantum Mechanics and Atomic Orbitals. So Schrodinger's equation was the 20th century. Schrodinger's equation is everything that caused the 20th century to do what the 20th century did. All of the nuclear bombs and, and making things and plastics and going to space, all of that was from Schrodinger. It's ridiculous, the equation is. Uh, if you were to write in small letters, it, the, the one equation would, would be farther than the page last. It would start earlier than the page and last farther than the page. I, I've worked with this equation, and it just makes you laugh. It's so stupidly hard. But you don't have to know anything about it other than that what's happening is that if you take this equation and you square the equation, it's like a function just like a function in algebra, where you can graph it and get some dots or some lines. If you graph this, the square of this function, you're going to get a probability of where an electron is in space. So this picture with the blue, the blue dots is what a hydrogen S1 orbital would look like. So an S1 orbit, I'll explain in just a minute. It's not, it's nothing hard. You're, all of you will learn it. It is simply where the one electron that is in a hydrogen electron would probably be. If you remember the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg, you can't know where an, an electron is and how fast it's moving or its momentum at the same time. So you can't really know exactly where it's going to be. So the best you can do is know where it probably is going to be. And this function tells you, if you square it, where the probability at any point in space that it's going to be. Okay, so you can take a point in space away from the nucleus and say, and put it in for this function and say, what about this? How probable would the electron be here? And then you could take it a further out distance and say, okay, what about this point in space? How probable will it be that the electron would be here? And you get a, well, it's a 1% probability or it's a 90% prob probability. And then the more probability you have, the bigger your dot at that place would be. So when you look at it, you say, oh, the electron in a one hydrogen electron is going to be very close to the nucleus because it's in a ball very close to the center. Okay, so it's just a probability. It's a very big, ugly math equation that shows how probable something is at a certain place. So the wave equation is designated with a psi or a psi, and the square gives you the probability at any place. Now, when you solve the wave equation, you get a set of functions called orbitals and the orbital with their energies. An orbital, I explained an orbital as a room for two college girls that hate each other. It is a region in space where two electrons reside, but they have equal charges, so they want to avoid each other all the time. So they are constantly avoiding each other in this orbital. So it's like a room that two girls that hate each other have to live in. So that's that's what an orbital is. So if you were to if you were to solve the function for any place, you're going to get an orbital and that orbital is where that electron actually lives. That's where it's like it's address. So if you solve that the, solve it for any one point, you're going to get the address of that electron. Where does that electron live? Where can you expect to find that electron? Okay? Each orbital describes a spatial distribution of density. How likely are you to find that electron where? Here, 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 here. And then you simply use a computer and then spit out dots. And then when you look at the picture, you say, oh, it's more likely to be here than here. An orbital is described by a set of three quantum numbers. Okay. Now, this is not that hard. I think you can get it. The first quantum number is the energy level on which the orbital resides. If you look at the periodic table, the first row, hydrogen and helium, are your first uh, small electrons, where you only have one electron or two electrons. That N equals 1 
is the hydrogen and helium uh, rooms, okay? Anything more than hydrogen and helium, and you're going to have to go to N equals 2, where you have lithium and beryllium and boron and carbon and nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And then as soon as that, that shell is full, you have to move to N equals 3. So your first or principal quantum number is all N, and it's just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, on your periodic table, you only have seven rows. Every element that we know of in the universe can fit in those seven rows. Now, the math could go forever, but what we've actually got can, all, can fit in seven, seven rows, seven n equals. So pr a quantum, a principal quantum number n equals seven would fill all the matter that we know of in the universe. So the values are integers equal to one and greater than one. So n equals one is the first, level, first row, hydrogen and helium. n equals two is the next row. Uh, uh, lithium, beryllium, etc., and then that's how you that's how you fill the first. So principal quantum number, very simple. The second uh, of the three quantum numbers tells you what subshell that's in. So you're going to see that you have a row, and then there are electrons that live in the in that row, but you have different regions of that row where you will have electrons likely to be, and they're called subshells. So think of that instead of a state, think of that as a city. So you have more than one city inside a state. You have more than one subshell inside a shell. And each row, each n equals, is going to have that many subshells. So the first row is going to have one subshell. And that one subshell, so n equals one, you're going to have one subshell. And that subshell is going to be called the S. For n equals 2, you're going to have two subshells. And that's going to be a P. For n equals 3, you're going to have three subshells. And that's going to equal a D. And for n equals 4, you're going to have four subshells. And that's going to be an F. So you have four. Now that completely fills everything that we know in matter. You could add more letters. I guess it would be a G. But there's not enough matter to fill that. So once you have row one, it has one subshell, just an S. If you have N equals two, it's going to have two subshells, the S and the P. Actually, I guess you could put that S and P. N equals 3, you're going to have three subshells, the S, the P, and the D. N equals 4, you're going to have four subshells, the S, the P, the D, and the F. So there's four subshells. And your angular momentum quantum number tells you which subshell that your electron lives in. Because really, all, all these quantum numbers are telling you is your address. So here it is. When L equals 0 you have one subshell called the S. If L equals one, so this is the angle quantum number, this is your second number. So your first number was N, N equals one, two, three, four. Your second angular uh, momentum quantum number is L. When L is zero, you've got one subshell, it's an S. When L is one, you've got two subshells, S and P. When L is two, you have three, S, P, and D. When L equals three, you have uh, four subshells, S, P, D, and F. Your third quantum number, okay, so now you have the state, you have the city, now you have your, your um, street or your house or whatever. The magnetic quantum number describes the three-dimensional orientation of the orbital. So it tells you how many orbitals, I'll write this down, how many orbitals, and remember what I said an orbital was? It's a room where two college girls who hate each other have to live. So how many orbitals are in each subshell? So think of a subshell as a dorm. And an S subshell is only going to have one room.
a P subshell is going to have three rooms. A D subshell is going to have five rooms, and an F subshell is going to have seven rooms. And a room is an orbital. So one room has two electrons in it. One spins one way, the other spins the other way. We'll see that later in another section. When S has one room, only one orbital. A P has three orbitals. A D has five orbitals. And an F has seven orbitals. So here's your, here is your um, a, a schematic here or a, a table. So if you have n equals 1, everything that's in n equals 1 is in the same shell. And you only have one subshell, and that's your s. And you only have one orbital in that subshell, and that is the only orbital in the subshell. Okay, so s only has one room in it, and a room is an orbital. In your second row, in your n equals 2, you have... Three, so you have three possible values of L, so you have three, um, or two, po you have two possibilities, so you have two subshells, sorry, you have two subshells, S and P. And so since you have S and P, S is going to have one orbital, and P will have three. Then in the next one, you'll have S, P, and D. So that's 1, 3, and 5. And in 4, you have S, P, D, and F. 1, 3, 5, and 7. If you give me all three of these, I will tell you where that electron is likely to be at any time.